networking is a muscle that you have to exercise, not only when you need something. Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook, presented by Details Interactive. Here you'll take away three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number six, and today's guest is Monica Smith. Monica is the founder and CEO of MarketSmith. Before we get started, a quick thank you, as always, to Max Brandstetter of the Wild Business Growth Podcast for producing this episode. You can reach him at max at hippodirect.com to help bring your podcast to life. Let's open the playbook. Ready? Break. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Marketing Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and today I'm joined by longtime industry friend Monica Smith, founder and CEO of MarketSmith. Monica is the driving force behind MarketSmith, Inc., a women-owned, data science-driven, performance-focused, omni-channel media and marketing agency that delivers real business impact for D2C and challenger brands in any category. The bedrock of her success has been the evolution, adaptation, and focused application of financial data into their products, services, and automation. They partner with marketers and brand advertisers to use financial and other data to monitor their ad purchasing in real time so that they can make the best marketing decisions. Marketers like Lovesack, Shark Ninja, Brother International Corporation, Toomey, Cross, and many more. Their mission, find challenger brands and make them champions. Welcome, Monica. Hey, Mark. Thanks very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I know you have a, a busy schedule. You've got lots going on. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump right uh, in. Yeah, well, congratulations on the podcast. It's, it's awesome. Out of, the, out of the gate. Well, thanks very much. It's uh, fun. I'm getting a chance to renew some relationships with people that um, you know, haven't spent uh, a lot of time with over the years and getting to meet some new people. Uh, we're trying to do a balance between uh, you know, really senior CEOs, some people that are, you know, starting up and, and being innovators and a good balance of, of women-owned businesses and, and businesses run by men and, you know, just kind of a, a mix of everything as best we can possibly do. So it's been a long time since you and I chatted. Uh, we both got our starts, I guess, in the, in the old catalog direct mail uh, business, right? That's correct. That's right. I, I started off in, um, direct marketing uh, for retail at a company called Walden Books um, that at the time was uh, an independent book uh, uh, retailer that uh, was purchased in the 90s uh, by Kmart. And they started a direct mail catalog for VHS tapes. So that's what I used to do. That's where I started. VHS tapes. You don't hear a lot about uh, VHS tapes. So that, I think I might have just dated myself. Yeah, well, you and me both. So, you know, we all are, you know, to some degree products of our upbringing. And in many cases, you know, folks I talk to, uh, you know, they have a very clear path of, you know, where they got to today was somewhat informed by their upbringing. So, you know, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, your background, your, your early uh, growing up. I, I know you come from a big family. Right. Well, I grew up here in uh, New Jersey, South Orange, with, I would say, a, a, a traditional Irish Catholic family. And I have six brothers. Both of my parents worked. So we were middle class uh, folks that were highly focused in on, you know, the basics. You go to school, you know, you have Sunday dinner. You, you keep your friends and your faith close and uh, you don't get tattoos. That was basically the, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I, that's what I learned. All right. And so you, uh, you went to school in New Jersey as well, right? Yeah. 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 So I, I went to, I, I went to college at the college of Mount St. Vincent in Riverdale, right over the, uh, over the bridge and spent four years uh, there. That was a, a communications school, um, mainly known for its nursing and teaching, which was, I think, my, what my parents were hoping um, I would go into. But I, 
knew out of the box that uh, I was going to be in communications, although I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing, being that writing and spelling were not my strongest suits. Right. And so, you know, if you go back to the the early days when, you know, direct mail was in fact direct mail. So direct to consumer was, you know, either catalog or postcards and then whatever was going on in, in physical stores. How did that experience prepare you for what you ultimately uh, created at MarketSmith? And, and we'll get into more detail there. So I think that the, the you know, the first thing is, is my college experience. Uh, I did two things that really shaped who I would eventually become. The first is, is that there was a, uh, I have a, a love of, of athletics. And so I played, I don't know how many seasons straight as a catcher, but softball was, is my passion and was my passion and really, really, really grateful for it because it really gave me an opportunity to learn the importance of not only strategy, but competition. And then when I was in college, I had the opportunity uh, to relaunch our college newspaper. And there was really no reason for me to really know how to do that. And I wasn't really too sure. So when the paper did launch, it was quite controversial, which would, as you know, my friend, um, kind of goes along with me a little bit. And so, you know, and the controversy was really being able to have an opinion um, and allow that opinion to take shape. And so I also learned at that point how to create something, how something needs to be financially stable in order for it to work. And, you know, again, teamwork came into it. But the importance of people was something that content um, how do you deliver something? What is interesting? What is offensive? Became something that I learned early on. So when I went to Walden Books right out of out of college, I got an opportunity through uh, alumni connection. And Walden Books was a classic retailer that was just one independent bookstore tying it together another one. And ultimately there they decided they wanted to expand beyond books and i was at the they wanted to do that through uh, direct mail and so this was amazingly enough uh, something called i was part of something that was launched called the preferred reader program where you literally used to pay ten dollars to give data to give your data what things you were interested in would you be able to get discounts? And so I was at the at the base camp of that effort and saw not only good entrepreneurial thinking, Mark, I saw it in a retail environment that was, you know, there was no, no other environment at the time. The internet was just burgeoning at that point. It was very, very early on. Um, and people then, I could see, made decisions about content they wanted to see. And I've always been fascinated with it. So from my perspective, I've always loved content. I really like how people make decisions. And I became fascinated with data. I think that those things together really excited me, ignited my passion. And I still have a deep and passionate love for specialty retail, even today. That's interesting. You know, you, you, you hit on a couple of things. Let's just jump um, into networking just for a second. You know, part of what we're trying to do on the marketing playbook is to, you know, give listeners a few different takeaways that they can you know, take back to their business or to their personal life. Um, your Walden experience, and I'm sure you can talk to lots of others, came from a, a networking connection, right? Yeah, it, it, it did. It, it was um, literally a alumni saw, was so happy to see the newspaper back in, in play after seven years of being defunct. I, I got an award for it. I was recognized for it. So when you get that early on recognition, um, being able to be recognized, not only for something you did with a certificate, but financial recognition early on and introduction to what eventually would be something I would love. My first job out of school, I absolutely loved. And it was a difficult, it was difficult because 
It had just, here's an entrepreneurial company that had just been taken over by a corporation. And so that would also be something that I would learn over the 20 years of my own company. I would deal with every single day. Yeah, that's amazing. So, you know, networking and connecting and staying in touch is, is obviously a really important thing. Um, you know, you talk about data and, and analytics, and we'll love to talk about that in the, in the context of MarketSmith in a minute. But just in general, that's not traditionally, at least, you know, when you got started, a, and, and I'll put this in air quotes, a woman's business. Um, and that's obviously changed quite a lot. But, you know, what kind of challenges did you face with, you know, that was something that you were very interested in, you in know, in a long time ago, but you may have been on an island, if I could use that um, back then. Well, you know, because I've shared with you over the years, my story, I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm shy about that. But I think that the first thing is on the networking side of things, networking is a muscle that you have to exercise, not only when you need something, right? And so for me, I am good at staying in touch and I'm also good at answering the phone. I am terrible, Mark, um, at asking for help. I am terrible uh, for reaching out. So it's a little harder for me. Um, and I think you probably know that because through the years as a woman owned company and being, you know, having my own business, it, it was extraordinarily lonely. It's less now. It's less now because I've, I've, I've matured. But um, I will tell you that there was no playbook. Uh, certainly there was very few, if any, I, women I could reach out to. And um, I thank God I have good understanding on, on, on relationships with men. I'm surrounded by them. And so that came in very handy because I was always uh, able to have a lot of male uh, counterparts and, and folks that I could reach out to or help when they needed. I, and, and on the networking side, I love to help more than I like to get help. If I could do it over again, and if I could give absolutely one takeaway on the networking side is it's so important to be able to ask for help. And it's also um, important to help those, even if there's, there's no gain, you know, because I think I've met so many people at different stages of their lives that have really needed a hand or a shoulder or an ear. Now you might not be able to do much. You might not just be a phone call or a suggestion or point somebody in the right direction. But, you know, I was never good at that for myself. And if I had to do it all over again, I would be so much more uh, aware of how important it is for self um, networking in my case. All right. But you've, we'll, we'll come to this uh, eventually in the conversation here because it's a big part of your life. Um, you do quite a bit to help a lot of people. So, um, you know, clearly you're, you're giving back and, and I know it's a big part of, of your life. But um, before we get to that, I was interviewing um, a, a major uh, retail uh, CEO recently. And, you know, um, I think, you know, as a, as a good marketer, there's a perfect question for you. One of the challenges of, of businesses today, um, you know, is, you know, if you're a retail brand and perhaps if you're wholesale, you know, you're relying so much on other companies to tell your story. So if I'm brand X and I'm a wholesaler, you know, I might be selling through the major department stores and mid-tier stores. I may have my own full price and factory outlet stores. I have the web. I'm probably selling on a number of different marketplaces. You know, you've been a storyteller over your career. How do businesses like that in today's market control their story and the message to their consumer when they're reliant on so many different channels? Well, I, you know, that's a really not only a good question. I mean, obviously, I'm quite passionate about that because Market Smith actually started ultimately because aside from the fact that I'm unemployable, um, <laughs> we, um, you know, I found a place to help those that didn't know how to tell their story, tell their story and, and find a way to connect um, to consumers. I will tell you that the what I do see right now is not a lack of storytelling is is the profound why a brand exists. Now, 
you know and I know that there are a lot of brands that have survived a lot of decades of change in marketing. When when we first started, brands that were once you know reveled and was able to you know they 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 had a place and and they existed under comfortably in the world of somebody else's brand. That's where you could find them. And they were quite comfortable with that. And here now, you know, you, every brand has to stand on its own, um, which I think is essentially what you're saying. And that is absolutely true. The, you can't just go right to marketing. You have to have a reason to believe. Why would anybody want or need your stuff? under that brand. And I always try to bring companies not back to the drawing board to say, hey, look, you got to create a mission statement. Now, you just have to have a center of gravity that everybody can say in the same voice and tone, this is why the consumer should believe. And when you can do that, then you have an understanding of why a product exists why does it exist at that price point and why is it selling or not in that certain channel? And I don't want to oversimplify it, but it is amazing to me today that brands continue. And, 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 and look, we benefit from that, right? We, we do not have a sales force here at MarketSmith. We do it. Everything is a referral that has come because somebody has suggested that they come here. And Part of that is how brands that are struggling either to start up or to find their way again. And we, you know, I bring them back to people can't buy something at a certain price point unless they really understand why they should. And that's, that's brands have to find their voice and they have to, they have to not only just be able to tell their story, they have to tell their genesis. Right. Got it. Uh, th that's great. I, I was last, I probably heard you heard me laughing out loud when you said you were unemployable, um, obviously somewhat tongue in cheek, but you know, what is it about you that, you know, you, you say that uh, self in a self deprecating manner? I don't, I, I used to say it in a self deprecating manner. Now I just say it honestly. Um, <laughs> so the, the, first of all, I think today I'm probably the most employable I've ever been in my life. I, I don't know whether I've broken myself or not, but I do find myself to be uh, extraordinarily skilled in most of the, in very, very difficult situations. But I was unemployable early on because I am classically impatient and believe that corporate uh, America was moving way too slow. Now, are they moving way too slow? Were they moving way too slow? Sure, in some cases, but not all. Um, and, you know, my fit was, you know, it's, you know, worked well with those that wanted to or needed to get things done. And those that just needed to make sure things were done well, or like the book, I, I, it didn't work so well for me. And I think that agility is a difficult, it's a great skill, but it's, it's, it's difficult and challenging at, at some points for folks because you can quickly move from one thing to another and be able to have a more sophisticated complex approach to something where where some others might not be able to do that and so i think that you know that fit is not always easy the speed the fit and it doesn't help if you know sometimes along the way i like to be funny you know sometimes <laughs> so, so i think right. you know not no fear of honesty and, and 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 liking to throw a little bit of humor has has not always worked in my favor Right. Understood. And so you mentioned uh, before um, MarketSmith, roughly 20 years old now? Yeah. Yeah. We right. just. And, I'm sorry. And, and right before you started MarketSmith, what were you doing? And what was it that you saw uh, a void and said, geez, I'm going to start this, this business and this is what we're going to do? 
Well, I, I didn't um, I didn't start Market Smith because I wanted to. I always thought I would be an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur, but the rest of my family, um, my brothers, my father, extraordinarily great company men, even my grandmother. So worked for great companies and had long have you know have long careers, very well respected. But I always wanted to own something. I, I just, ever since I was a kid, I, I would play with my brother, uh, Timmy and he would play radio station. He was the DJ and I owned the radio station. I would, I would actually write there. I used to tell him he was playing too many, too much music. We had to get some ads in there for, you know, Tic Tacs. And that's like, funny. That's funny. It's the, and it's, it's the truth. He works for Sony and he's been there almost 25 years. So, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, but I started MarketSmith because I was fired from my last company and um, in a blaze of glory, I realized that I had saved my money. I was ultimately prepared. I was uh, for it. I thought um, I was 29 and I wanted, I, I wanted a break from uh, fearing, you know, being, you know, whether I was going to be accepted or not accepted. But I was fired uh, ultimately for coming out, and um, I really didn't want after you after you go through that. Now you can't be fired today for that, but after going through that, it took years of of to build up my confidence, Mark. So you know, turning back or Market Smith failing wasn't really an option. I didn't start it because it was between jobs. I started it because I jumped off a cliff and I wasn't going back. Um, so I had to make it work. So you didn't look at it as a risk necessarily. Oh, I mean, I think everybody looked at me. I had a home, uh, you know, I had, you know, with it, my family was like, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I was, I had just had a commitment ceremony with my wife. I mean, it was, it, trust me, there, it was like, everybody was afraid. Um, and I was, I was just upset, you know, I had, I had a really, really strong career um, and I was doing very, very well. Um, and, you know, it would just, it got really messy for a bit, but the net net of Market Smith starting was, it was the end of me hiding who I was. It was the beginning of me finding my way and ultimately finding true happiness because I absolutely have, I have no regrets at all. None. The devil's in the details. You've probably heard that phrase time and time again in your professional life. Projects get started with great intentions, but you no longer have the time to pay attention to the little things that could be the difference between success and failure. At Details Interactive, you can discuss your business with a seasoned direct-to-consumer marketing executive who's helped launch and grow web businesses and integrate multi-channel marketing initiatives. Learn more at DetailsInteractive.com. All right, I'm a, a retailer, specialty retailer, and you know, I mentioned at the, at the top here are some of the brands that you work with. Why do I come to MarketSmith? You know, you said that you don't have a sales force. It's some referrals from, you know, other people that have worked for you. Generally speaking, tell us a little bit about the services that you provide and the problems, you know, that you, you help retailers solve or, or clients solve. So I, you know, the, the, the reason why folks come to us, because we have had a really strong track record of of growth for clients and so and that is not easy to come by because you know we we started off as a strategic marketing agency which was ultimately um as you know the focus of bringing direct mail practices to general brand marketers and we our first really decade was focused in on organization of data and putting financial applica applications to it and then being able to segment customers and uh, communicate to them effectively through whichever channels were burgeoning at the time or effective or available. And so we are, I would say that I am a, uh, a marketing uh, operations uh, expert that understands um, core marketing practices 
to the data level. And so in the organization of especially where companies have been bought or sold or merged and acquired, uh, have expressed have seen downturns or have seen challenging um, traffic uh, like we see in a lot of specialty real estate retailers now where the, the traffic has has diminished because of where they are. We're extraordinarily good at going in and finding where the, the most precious moments of the business existed and identifying them very quickly and beginning to understand how do we replicate them, bring them forward and then replicating them um, and ensuring that the entire team on the inside knows how to come along for the ride. So it's not sitting outside of us. It's not just about running media or a really great creative campaign. It is it is the ability to integrate and to um, surround the marketing data and begin to frame up a good strategic plan forward that gets organized and held accountable every month. So if I, I put you on a spot, you know, and if you look at, I don't know, maybe think about a recent, you know, new client that you had, doesn't matter who they are, what was their problem, right? You know, they sat down with you, you know, on your initial call, or they came in for the initial meeting. What did they describe to you as we have this problem? Was it about traffic? Was it about segmentation? T tell me what it, what it was. Well, you know, I, I think about just in, you know, the last month alone, I think we've, we've had, you know, five different clients come on board, all from a jeans company that a high end jeans company that started out as an independent and was purchased all the way up to a, a publicly traded uh, company. In every case um, of the, the, the different products and companies and brands that we're talking about, everybody comes back to one core thing. They do not know how to get their customers to respond in a very timely fashion against the marketing dollars they're spending. And so we go in, assess what they have done and understand where they're probably going wrong and we quickly adjust to getting them to a recommended marketing program to move forward. Is that direct mail? Is that an integrated TV with radio? It all depends. And so we test against where they currently are until we can find what is the strongest path forward. Because we have a extraordinarily good way of consuming data from outside, organizing it and putting financial metrics to it, visualizing it, we are able to understand both in the customer segmentation process, where the strongest customers are, and also where are the strongest marketing programs that they've had over the last X number of years, and be able to bring that forward in an investigative fashion in order to have a strong reason to move forward. So we're really good at organizing historical data to find the greatest strengths of a company and then being able to understand what were the pitfalls from the, the worst moves they made and help them actively avoid those while leaning into things they might have thought what weren't really that strong because they weren't able to attribute it accurately or there was a change in, for instance, um, They've cut back on some of their retail locations or their outlet locations, and they're just having a hard time moving forward with that, with uh, making strong business decisions, mainly because they can't, their team is not, cannot get a handle of large data sets and are having a hard time understanding. Yeah, sure. They might want to do a direct mail piece. They might want to do a more significant email segmentation process but they ultimately can't get their hands around the data. And so therefore that's what we do. Right. And you use the A word. Um, I like to talk about it that way, the word of attribution. And, you know, it's funny, um, I'm doing a, a, a conference where I'm going to be hosting a, a panel and you know, it's around CMOs and, and how the CMO role has changed. And, and we can talk about that too. Um, and, you know, I, gave them a list of questions and I said to them, you know, look, I'm going to ask the A question of attribution at the end. 
And, you know, one of them said, good, ask it at the end. Maybe we won't have to talk about it. So, you know, attribution is, is obviously something that's really, um, you know, in, in many cases, problematic for people to figure out how their marketing dollars are working. So is that something that you guys are doing, helping me as a retailer or as a brand figure out where to change the media mix uh, and the spend? Yes. So I think that the first thing is, is that I, I think attribution is probably not as hard as people think it is. The problem is, is who gets responsibility? Who, who gets the who gets the win? And what we find over and over again that it's through uh, media mix modeling that you get to see that it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but individually on their own, they couldn't get it done. So um, media mix modeling allows us to do attribution modeling much more effectively. And our ability on that also helps us do what most of the attribution companies cannot do or will not do is risk scenario planning. So when you do risk scenario planning, you are able to use historical data and then put forward um, things that you don't know for fact or for certain, but you can say that um, for certain that on risk planning, you can lay out the greatest risks that most likely exist and also those that are obvious winners. And so we're strong in that area. Uh, we do that day in and day out. And to be quite honest with you, if we didn't have those things, I don't know why you would really come to MarketSmith at this point, because it, it, from a media perspective, Mark, everybody can sell you media. It is, it is available, it is everywhere. And you, know, you don't need uh, independent um, agency right outside of Morristown to do that for you. What we bring um, is that, that ability to look at omni-channel attribution and optimization with uh, clear eyes because of, you know, as you, as you know from, from your background, predictive uh, was, is core to how you run direct marketing effectively. So leaning into media mix modeling and attribution modeling is something that is, and, and proper customer segmentation are the strong things that we do. It's core to our DNA and it's what's helped us continue to deliver upon the promise. So that's the, the secret sauce is, is that aspect of, of what you do. And what and is, I, yes, absolutely. That that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, talk about, um, I predict this, w what is that um, underneath the umbrella of, is it under the umbrella of market Smith or is it a separate standalone? No, no. So, um, so over the years, um, Market Smith, um, I started. I had spun off a, a software company called iPredictus. Uh, I raised uh, millions of dollars from uh, some um, independent um, fellows that 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 believed in it, and it it it, is, it was used originally as a predictive modeling tool to help understand the impact and. And, and to forecast what was going to most likely be the best direct response media that you could buy um, prior to you buying it. Fast forward over the years now, it has become a uh, attribution as well as media mix with a visualization tool. In two years ago, uh, or, uh, you know, probably now, four years ago, I bought everyone out. Everybody got their money back plus, which was good for them. Uh, bad for me, but good for me. It, ultimately, <laughs> I was, I'm glad I did it, but I will tell you it was tough. It was really tough, um, but I'm glad I did it again because the idea of reporting into a board for my own company was ultimately um, not something I found fun, but I, I renamed it Market Smith IQ. We brought it under the Market Smith umbrella. And then during that time from the last 10 years, we also had acquired a creative agency um, that had been around, actually is older than me, um, a company that was called Brushfire. So we had acquired them and I had also uh, acquired back my, essentially my own IP. Um, and I brought them all under one umbrella called Market Smith now. So, um, and it is core market. I mean, there's literally not a person in our organization that does not use the product because it's it really it's it's the only thing that can set us apart at this point. Right. 
Oh, I'm sitting here somewhat smiling because I've known you for so long. And I remember when you started the business and, you know, we've stayed in contact, um, you know, periodically all these years and to see what, you know, you have developed um, and, and your place in the industry. It's, it's really uh, fantastic to, to see. Uh, you should be congratulated. Uh, how many Thank people you. in your company now? We are 75 people. Wow. Well, yes, that's, that's great. Um, yeah. let, let's uh, go a little bit into your uh, your home life. Um, you know, you've talked about it. You you made a comment earlier about uh, coming out and how that uh, uh, impacted uh, your professional life. But you know, your home life is um, a really interesting one. Um, you want to talk a little bit about um, your children and um, some of the other charitable stuff that you guys are doing together. So, so Amy and I have been together. Um, I, I think now 25 years, at least that's what she tells me. And um, <laughs> probably 10 plus years ago, uh, she and I had always thought that it was important to have kids. We just weren't sure how to get there. Um, so the two things that were important to us at that time, you know, as we've been getting older or even when we were kind of leaning into just dating and understanding our future was one that we were, you know, ultimately going to live our lives out loud, not in anybody's face, but we didn't want to hide in the shadows. And we did want to have a place where, you know, we could do things with animals. So we started, I think, 15 years ago, a nonprofit, a 5013 called, uh, 3C called One More Smith. And it is, it is an animal sanctuary that sits on our property in Chester. I don't know how many animals we have, uh, but there's uh, these. This is a forever home for those that uh, essentially what my brothers call one-eyed cats plus. So we've that's been happening since I don't know a long time. Hundreds of animals um, that we've helped through the years, um, and then we also now you know we have five children all of who are adopted that came to us. Um, one is a group of, of, of kids that came to us from Newark. They came all under the age of five, all in one day dropped on our doorstep. And uh, we've, you know, we've enjoyed seeing them grow and they, it, it is parenting is tough. And then a little one uh, showed up on our doorstep, I guess, six years ago now, six and a half years ago. And uh, Amy and I were both, you know, working and busy. And when she came, uh, she, we weren't looking uh, the, the, you know, her, unfortunately her mom and her grandmother had gotten arrested in our town and, and the Chester police just thought, oh, she wasn't going to be long, you know, that she would not be in jail long. And so they said, can you just keep her for a couple of days? And well, she, you know, fast forward, she just had her seventh birthday last week. And so she's still with us. She's now our daughter. Uh, and she learned to walk. Her first steps were actually in, at Market Smith. I don't know if that's good or bad, but. Well, that's, that's good. Yeah, you, well, you were putting her to work. Is that what you're telling everybody? Well, I was just telling you that the, the upside or maybe the downside of being a working mom is sometimes the kids have to go to work with you. And so, um, here at Market Smith, we allow, uh, we, we're very uh, mom and children friendly. And so it's not unusual to see kids here. It's a little bit more modern today. You know, you can use Microsoft Teams and allow parents to be able to work from home when their kids are sick or there's a doctor's appointment. But, you know, so kids are here. Uh, we are animal centric. And I guess about eight years ago, we started another nonprofit. Um, most folks know it as its branded name called Bring Dinner Home. And uh, we have adopted a school in Newark where I guess it was after Hurricane Irene. And, uh, and we started uh, feeding, oh, it started out probably 600 or so folks at Thanksgiving dinner and then gave them uh, groceries to take home. And then it morphed in this last year. I think we fed a thousand plus people, uh, gave away 2000 plus coats. Uh, I don't know how many books. And, um, I mean, when I tell you boxes and boxes, uh, hundreds and hundreds of boxes of diapers. So that's, you know, 
our ability to be able to kind of network again, you know, bringing my network in, as you know, because I hit you up and everybody else up on uh, helping um, pull this thing together that runs like a machine now and uh, gets really materials, um, goods, and things that are needed into the poorest communities. Yeah, well, you've certainly demonstrated that, you know, people can have a strong balance of, of home life and, and work life and be successful in, in both aspects. So congratulations. Re really great story. Thank you. So we're ending, uh, getting down to the wire here, and I yep. do something um, uh, with each of the guests, kind of a two-minute drill, keeping with the the theme of the playbook. And uh, I have a few questions going to ask. Just give me random thought if uh, if you're up for it, okay? Sure. All right. Uh, a brand that you admire or that inspires you? Shark Ninja. Okay, way to get a plug in for a client, right? Yes. Uh, um, favorite app on your phone? Oh, for sure, Blinkist. What is that? Blinkist is a 20 minute read of all of the books that are out there, a condensed version of every book that, it, that hits the market. Oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna check that one out. The last website other than Amazon that you shopped from? Oh, well, I have to shop uh, regularly from, a, you know, certain types of retailers because my kids are tall and thin. So <laughs> um, you, you, you look at any one of those uh, very specifics like banana and all of those folks and, and I'm on it. Okay. Something that you're not good at, but that you wish that you were. Oh, I wish I was succinct. Okay. Well, for a uh, podcast, that's good that, uh, you know, you like to, to tell stories. That's, that's a good thing. Um, a charitable organization, this is an easy one for you that you're passionate about. Well, the most important organization out there for me is the Center for Great Expectations. Okay. And that is a, that's located um, down by in the Rutgers area. And it is uh, founded by a gal by the name of Peg Wright, who helps moms that are um, addicted and or have been abused or have mental illness uh, who are pregnant, uh, bring um, their children into the world or manage them for the first, I think it's up to the age five now, and other women and men come in um, and help raise their kids in the same environment as they are so they can get healthy and well. That's great. Sounds like a great cause. Uh, two more. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Uh, probably if I could freeze people. Freeze them. Okay. Yeah. From, from making, saying things that shouldn't be said or behaviors that they shouldn't do. Okay, good. And, and then, then last... I'd unfreeze them. <laughs> After you told them what they were doing wrong? Well, just, just so the thought of what they were about to do stopped and then they would forget why they, they were going about to do what they're going to do. Cause I think that, you know, ultimately the world, I'm very, very focused right now on the world being um, more compassionate and more reasonable and more empathetic to others. And so I think that corporate, um, the corporate world is where I would do it first. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I uh, interviewed the, the CEO of Levi's uh, recently, and you know, they're a, a company that you know, is really out there from a social purpose perspective and taking stands on, on lots of very important issues. Um, so I, I hear you on that. Um, and then the last one, other than your family, what's your most prized possession? Oh, well, I'm not really good at that stuff, Mark. You know that. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't, you know, I'm not, that's not my thing. Um, but you know, I'm grateful that I have an Apple watch. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. you know why? Because it's really important for me to see my steps and my heart rate. Like if I'm being, you know, you know, being healthy and, and doing the right thing. And then also being able to see my messages and all that other stuff. It's very, very helpful. So I do love the Apple watch. Okay, great. All right. So we're at the end here. Where can uh, people reach out to you on social media if they want to catch up with you, Monica? Okay, so I, I am a, a very good responder to all emails. So you can always get me at msmith at marketsmithinc.com. You can always visit our website, um, which is marketsmithinc.com. 
And um, I think that you could also catch us on Market Smith on LinkedIn as well as Facebook. Okay, great. Hey, Monica, it was great to catch up with you. I appreciate your time. It's nice to hear um, how your business is uh, performing so well uh, and how you're helping marketers uh, deal with some of their most important challenges. Uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. All right, Mark, good job and um, uh, good luck with this and uh, stay out of trouble, my friend. I will. Take care. Thanks. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Monica Smith for coming on the Marketing Playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, roadblocks are often put up in front of you while you build your career. Use them to make you stronger and better focused on your goals. Number two, we've heard this one before, networking. One of the most important aspects of building and maintaining your career is how you engage with people in your network. Don't be afraid to leverage the people you know for introductions. As Monica said, exercise the muscle, but not only when you need help. And number three, so many retailers don't know how to get customers to respond to their marketing efforts. Having a good plan to consume and organize data, being able to put financial metrics against that data, and then being able to action your marketing tactics differently is crucial to your success. And don't forget, just having technology is not the answer. You also have to have the people to interpret the analysis. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Details Interact and learn more at DetailsInteractive.com. Until next time, the devil is in the details. Yeah.